Viewers, I want to bid you welcome to this video. This is your host. I know it's been a little while now. Haven't been uploading as re as uh, consistently as I've been in a little while. I recently went on a road trip, and anyway, um, any and had other stuff going on. But anyway, this is a another uh, real real tape recorder we're going to be showing you guys now. It's not in mint condition. I warn you. I know it's in the box, but it doesn't mean it's mint in the box. It's been used. It's not in the best cosmetic shape, but it's in the box. Nor is a box in the best cosmetic shape either, but this is a very interesting recorder. It is the Telectro MR511, or more precisely the Electro, I mean, excuse me, the Telectro MR511B reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. Now, a, a shout out to Clydeside. Clydeside has the same model recorder. He made a video back in 2008 on his Telectro MR511 and I've been wanting to get that model so I found the uh, Telectro on eBay and um, it's a very interesting recorder for several reasons. Uh, one thing is, is it's uh, one of the older models, i.e., I mean, most portable reel to reels are from the mid 60s to late 60s, some in the somewhat early 60s, but this one's really early 60s. This one came into existence, uh, this model came into existence in 1960. There is an article I will post a link in the description. Men, uh, introducing this Telectro recorder in 1960 for Telectro's new 1961 line of tape recorders and I just think that's really cool that it goes back to 1960 noting how close that was to the 50s and also being that this recorder unlike a lot of the portable reel to reels that people will find this recorder is actually made in the United States of America, which is, ironically, in the U.S., it's very rare to find American-made, battery-operated reel-to-reel tape recorders. Save for those general electric reel-to-reel -reel portables, those ones are plentiful and very cheaply made at that. But, um, in general, most portable reel-to-reels a collector is going to come across are Japanese as well as European machines, but not very often are they actually made in the United States. So I think that's really cool to have one made in the U.S. Now, I do have the original manual and a little, um, probably this was a tag that would have been attached to the Telectro on display to try to get people to look at it. And anyway, if we zoom in, gee whiz, every time without fail, am I right? Okay, so... The New World of Living Sound Telectro Telet Series Compact Transistorized Portal Tape Recorder Model MR511 Telectro Division Dumont Emerson Corporation which I think is the same as the modern company Emerson if I'm not mistaken and and then over here the pinnacle of quality I don't know about that Telectro tape recorder. I mean, it is decent quality, but I wouldn't call it the pinnacle. MR511 Telet series. Weighs under 7 pounds. Governor controlled motor. Precision belt and capstan flywheel drive. Operates on 7 pin light size AA batteries. 2 speed 1 and 7 eighths and 3 and 3 fourths inches per second. Up to one and a third hours record playtime, single function control, record interlock, prevents accidental erasure. Drum roll for this one. Four transistor amplifier. Oh boy. Typically you see four transistor um, commonly associated with uh, El Cheapo low end rim drive reader reel tape recorders that are DC biased. Uh, be prepared for a surprise with this one. 
etched circuit and steel case for ruggedness. Now that's a neat thing because at the time this recorder was made, printed circuit boards were still a fairly new um, thing and still a lot of electronics at the time period were point-to-point -point wiring. So this one using a printed circuit board was quite a cool thing. Um, external headphone slash speaker jack and external power supply jack the finest tape recorders made in America are Telectro engineered. Again, I don't think the finest recorders made in the entire United States were Telectro. I would imagine probably the finest would have been Ampex. But anyway, that is a little uh, Telectro deal there. And um, of course, this is going to be a long video. I warn you, you can already see the length is pretty long. Um, so bear with me. But anyway, of course, feel free to skip around if you want. Unless your internet has a connection that is so bad that every time you try to skip around, you just get a loading wheel forever and then switch it to 144p in anger. But anyway, operating instructions, model MR511 to speed. Here we go, look at that. Transistorized! Foley, portable, battery operated, tape recorder, Telectro, yada yada yada, in Long Island, in New York. And we open this up here and you can see the instructions on the operation of the Telectro MR511 reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and um, it's quite something really it's actually an extremely basic recorder it talks about using mercury cells or dry cells one thing I wish they still made today. Today's day, today's age is so much about everyone is so sensitive about every little thing. But I really wish they still made mercury batteries. I never had the pleasure of actually being able to own any mercury batteries, but I heard that they not only lasted an extremely long time, but their voltage was incredibly stable throughout the life of the battery, and uh, and I just. I'm amazed by that, and I really wish they still made mercury batteries for Pete's sake. Manual is also printed in the United States of America. Um, this is just a... Uh... Yes, come in. Oh, sorry, I locked the door. You won't be able to see the door, unfortunately. It's kind of blocked. Hey, Luke. How's it going? I'm alright. Come over here, come over here. Close that door though. Come over here, come over here. So, how's it going? <laughs> so we got a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder here. So what do you think about this little uh, Telectro reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder? Uh, it's okay, I guess. Let's take a look uh, under the cover here. What do you think of that? Mm, it's, uh, seems alright to me. Pretty yeah. cool, eh? This yeah, recorder. By the way, Daniel down in the uh, over down street, the street at that. Uh, you know, that's a really good question. I don't know. He might be. I would not I be. Know, I just saw him. Everyone, someone was playing volleyball, and it was apparently there's some kind of worship there. Oh, cool. Uh, he might be there with John. If his car is not here, uh, John is the guy that works there at K Life, and and uh, he he and Daniel. Well, his car's not here. That's why I was asking. Okay. Well, yeah, he might be over there on a mystery run. So. Yeah. I don't know why he would take his car to come down the street. <laughs> he probably still would do that. So anyway, oh, I didn't want to reveal the opening yet, although you already know what it looks like anyway. Okay, so. Anyway, I gotta study. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Okay. So back to this here. Um, the Electrosonic Corporation Factory Authorized Surge Service Agencies Revision One. This just shows all the different uh, service agencies that one could contact, and um, it just is a whole list of uh, different, uh, you know, states. Oh, you got Arkansas. Only well, got uh, two places: one in Little Rock and one in Texarkana, Arkansas. And various various different uh, states and uh, cities within those states and uh, anything outside of the US you got Canada but uh, you got Hawaii of course which is of course within the US but not the, the mainland US but 
The only other country I see on here is Canada, so um, not even Mexico was on here, so okay. And then you have these uh, warranty uh, registration cards that have never gotten filled out. Pretty cool. I mean, everything was obviously kept with this recorder. It's just sad that it's not in mint uh, condition. Um, I, I, I suspect that it was uh, stored in a uh, humid, damp or so environment. But, um, yeah. So, but I'll be showing you more soon. Now, on to the bad news. Bad news is in the way of cosmetics. First, you see all this? That's my fault. Now, it's not a permanent thing. It could be undone. It's just hot glue that's seeping through the metal grill because your metal grill was coming loose, so I went ahead, took it off. I tried double-sided tape, which did not work well at all because it just kept coming, peeling, you know. So I switched to hot glue. Hot glue, of course, is holding this vent on nice. Downside is it's kind of seeps through the holes, so it visibly is noticeable. So that's not the best thing in the world. But that's something that could technically be rectified um, with enough TLC. But a really bad thing is Notice along the chrome finish here, you'll see it's kind of looks tattered here. This is instances of actual corrosion, I believe. Not battery corrosion, but just corrosion probably from a moist environment or something over the years because it's just kind of eaten away at the chrome. And um, not only do you have that around uh, some of this chrome finish here, but you also the window, you can see the reel down inside, you can see a little section of this has also been, the chrome coating has been eaten away. Now, I did find online they do make chrome paint. So I'm thinking one of these days I may get some chrome paint to touch that up and try to make it look better. Here's a little bit more of a close-up of the front. You can see kind of where the hot glue is set through there. Uh, not the best thing in the world, but um, the vent's holding on a lot stronger at least, um, so at least I'll live with that for the time being. Um, on the side also you can see there's a little bit of corrosion that affected the metal here unfortunately with age. And then on the other side here you can see a lot more corrosion, again not battery corrosion, but just corrosion in general has managed to affect right there. And then also right here, one of this strap pieces here has broken off. The rivet piece is here, but it looks like there's some slight corrosion on there. And I think it's corrosion is probably what led to this popping off. So really, I think whatever environment this was stored in, the climate was not really uh, very good and uh, has led to the machine corroding. Again, it's not batteries. The reason why is because the original battery uh, compartment that is the actual holder for the batteries, you'll see it in Clyde Sight's video, the holder for the batteries is was completely missing and I saw no evidence of battery corrosion in any of the circuitry or on the battery compartment. It's the battery uh, snap connector, the same type you put on a 9 volt. Didn't see any corrosion on there, so I don't think it's battery corrosion. I think it's just corrosion. And then now we'll do the grand reveal. We're going to open this up so you can see what it looks like. Of course, if you've seen Glideside's video, you already know what it looks like. But I really, really like the way this one looks. And I, I'm purposely going for a long-winded video here. I already know it's going to be long. I'm not trying to make it short. I'm letting myself chin wag to my heart's content. I don't care. I'm just... This is one of those videos. And if you don't like it, then, you know, it's up to you. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. So anyway, um, of course... Me beholding the way this looks, I love the way this machine looks. Now, some might see it's not the most symmetric thing in the world. It's all weird, sh weirdly shaped and everything. And some people might not like that. 
But boy, in my opinion, it looks really, really, really interesting because it's so unique and different than your typical recorder. Um, one thing is it's not a three and a half inch reel recorder. It's a three inch only or smaller, of course, because there's not room to have the extra large size reel up. And um, another thing is the fact I like how the reels are spaced apart from each other. So some recorders, the reels are right next to each other, and then the, the tape kind of goes downward to where the head is kind of underneath. But in this one, the head is like in, in between. The cap stand and everything is in between the reels, and the reels are on each side of it. And it just it gives it a very interesting and unique look, and I really like it. And of course, I also really, really like the gray. Gray is one of my favorite colors, so this gray here around there, I mean, it's a very light gray. It's almost white but not really white it's it's definitely gray but very light gray it might look kinda white in the video but it's really very light gray um, I love gray now I will warn you for anyone out there who might acquire one of these Telectros for their collection this plastic is very thin or it you're not super thin but it's it feels very fragile when, I, when you take this plastic off to remove it to, to service the recorder, it feels like it could eat, break very easily. It just feels very cheap. So keep that in mind. I saw another Telectro on eBay which was in bad cosmetic condition that had a broken off piece of plastic right here. Which kind of helps make me think, add to me thinking that this is a pretty uh, easy to break plastic material. So just be careful there. But anyway, the recorder is operating. Um, when I first tried this out, of course I had to hook up external power. I made an educated guess that it was positive ground considering uh, 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 certainly it would be using uh, germanium uh, PNP transistors, which it does. And um, so chassis ground is positive. So when you, you can get a tip, you can get a, a quarter inch jack where the uh, tip is your negative and your ring is your positive and plug it into the only quarter inch socket this recorder has and supply it with 10.5 volts that's the operating voltage of the recorder is designed for because it used seven uh, double A's now I got one 9 volt uh, in here instead because I don't have the battery holder so I'm running it off a 9 volt and it'll work off a 9 volt but just the amplifier won't perform at maximum performance with the 9 volt. The motor speed is still correct though. The recorder will run down to I think about 6.5 volts before your motor speed starts to lower. So, now did you hear that? That 9 volt is already getting low. Do you know how little I've used this off the 9 volt battery? probably be less than 30 minutes of runtime on this 9 volt battery and it's already getting low as you can tell this thing will eat batteries it draws 100 milliamps uh, when running on 10.5 volts and close to 100 milliamps off a 9 volt battery I think more like 0.09 uh, amps or 90 milliamps and but I just noticed this thing seems to eat up the 9 volt battery so whenever I can I like to run it off an external supply anyway it's a very interesting tape recorder now this recorder, when I first got it, the mechanical section, I, I was amazed. The mechanical section worked perfectly. Obviously the rewind is noisy as you hear, but aside from that annoyingness, the mechanical section was working perfectly. The rubber in this recorder, I can't believe how good the rubber is. The original belt isn't even loose. Let that sink in. The original belt is not even loose. The pinch rollers rubber feels fresh. 
I mean, the rubber in this thing is surprised, and I mean, has lasted surprisingly well. So the mechanics just work just perfectly whenever I, you know, everything, the rewind is plenty of torque, and you know, the speed is consistent, and the motor is operating beautifully. The governor is working very well. But the amplifier, of course, was extremely weak. Weak, 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 weak. Pretty much no sound um, coming through the amplifier off of a tape. Um, even though a signal a signal injector at the head would still, you'd hear it out of the amp. But when you tried playing a recording that was made on a tape, it was so weak you could best most faintly hear sound. It was leaky electrolytics. Surprise, surprise. Replace electrolytics. Problem solved. Okay, so, and there were some other deals with the speaker that I'll describe later. Technically described it earlier. I'll show that video footage later. This recorder came with a crystal mic. It's a microphone that can stick to the side, and it has a jack that is covered up when you put the mic because it's just hollow there, so the plugged-in jack is just covered up like that. Very lightweight, plastic-cased mic, and... Of course, this is a well-made machine. Mechanics-wise, the mechanics are metal. For the most part, it's solidly made. It's just this top part's plastic. But the actual chassis is metal. You'll see that later. But this microphone here is crystal and really is just poor quality, as you'll hear. I'm making a recording on the Telectro MR511 on this. Probably one of the longest videos I've ever made, save for my mechanical pencils number 5. And, um, this long-winded video that no one's going to sit through the entirety of, or maybe a few people will, is a Telectro MR511B. I'm just in one of those moods right now, that's all. And, um, one of those moods means I'm going to keep on j jibber jabbering non-stop. So, you'll hear, it's going to sound pretty bad. Video that no one's going to sit through the entirety of, or maybe a few people will, it is a Telectro MR511B. I'm just in one of those moods right now, that's all. And, um, one of those moods means I'm going to keep on jibber jabbering non-stop. You'll notice two things. Thing number one. Tinny sound, courtesy of the crystal microphone. Thing number two. Buzzing sound. The buzzing is courtesy of the fluorescent light nearby with this... Uh, this just wrapped uh, cord here. It's not shielded at all, so they're picking up hum. And of course the crystal microphones are absolutely atrocious when it comes to bass response, resulting in tinny sound. So, to improve upon things, I'm going to use the Sony F96 dynamic microphone. I'm who knows why a recorder priced at $129.95 in 1960, why they wouldn't have put things like a VU meter and a dynamic mic, yada 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 into the recorder, who knows? Although I can't say one reason why this probably, why it doesn't have a VU meter. The recording made on this dynamic mic will explain why. I'm making a recording. Uh, you'll hear the crystal microphone first, just again to kind of get a uh, nice compare and contrast. I'm making a recording on the Telectro MR511 on this, probably one of the longest videos I've ever made, say for my mechanical pencils, number five. And um, this long-winded video that no one's going to sit through the entirety of, or maybe a few people will, it is a Telectro MR511B. I'm just in one of those moods right now, that's all. And um, one of those moods means I'm going to keep on j jibber jabbering nonstop. Mm -hmm. I'm making a recording. So, to explain about this earlier, I mentioned this recorder is for transistor. Now, for those of you all who know a little bit about tape recorders, are probably not expecting four transistor and AC bias to comfortably live together because typically four transistor is you have your first two stages, it's just, you know, first two transistors and then you have a push-pull output, which is your other two transistors. And 
you buy a oscillator is also going to have to use a transistor for it and well then you're going to want to have five transistors right another option is to have a single transistor output on the audio amplifier and three transistors for the amplifier and one for the bias but that's that's not how it's done they like to switch things around in this particular recorder's design. In playback, it's a regular four transistor amplifier. That is, two transistors uh, amplifying it, and then that driving a push-pull output. The two transistor push-pull output. But, when you record on this recorder, it's a little bit different. When you record, as far as driving the tape head is concerned, you only got the first two amplifier stages. That is, only two transistors. Then you have one transistor that's not used at all in the push-pull pair, and then the other transistor out of the push-pull pair is switched into the bias oscillator circuit instead, used for the bias. So whenever you're making a recording, you're actually only using three of the transistors, two of them for amplification, and one of them for the oscillator. And then whenever you're playing back, you're using all four transistors for the amplifier. So that's a pretty interesting design, a way they can utilize quality things such as AC bias with a low transistor count like four transistors to save on those special expensive transistors. But the downside is two transistors driving the head is probably not really quite enough to drive a meter I imagine or a level light. I'm thinking that's probably why one reason why this recorder does not have a level meter. Um, so anyway, that's that's my guess as to why this doesn't have a level meter. But the nice thing is, is it's pretty forgiving with levels. The level is set all the way up, and the audio quality should still be pretty good, even though it's probably saturating the tape. Though I have not, I'll be honest with you, played this back on another machine yet to see what the actual recording level of the recorder itself is. I apologize for that because I'm just too lazy to do that right now. And I'll just say it how it is. I'll just be completely bull, blank, up, blunt and honest with you and say I'm not about to do that right now because I'm too freaking lazy, okay? Deal with it. Okay. Level is set back at close to three. A little bit under three. So you can see even whenever I had the level set all the way up to five, it still retained decent sound quality. So... This recorder does seem to be quite forgiving with the setting of levels, which I think is good. Um, DC bias recorders probably wouldn't be quite as forgiving. Um, so, anyway, it's a pretty neat recorder. Now, that was at 3 and 3 fourths. We're going to be going to 1 and 7 eighths now. This is a very interesting design that Clyde side, of course, in his video shows in very great detail. You have a special lever here. Up, it's three and three fourths. But when you go down, it pushes down a built in capstan sleeve, and now you run it at one and seven eighths. Or should I say, one and squeaky seven eighths. I don't use one and seven eighths much on this recorder because it's very muffled. There is no equalization change, of course. My personal recommendation is that 1 and 7 eighths recording is made at a higher recording level with the crystal mic for voice intelligibility, though you will have some sibilant S's from the crystal microphones on pre-emphasis of treble, but it's for the pre-emphasis of treble reason that I recommended a crystal microphone. Now let's use a dynamic microphone at 1 and 7 eighths inches per second. Okay, the level's been set now, a little down, down to four now, but I'm using a dynamic microphone. I just want to see how this is sounding at uh, one and seven eighths inches per second with the dynamic mic. Um, to demonstrate it in the video, of course. Let's see how this is. Bye bye. I mean, it's still it's not so bad, really, for voice for speech. It just is a it's considerably muffled when running it at a. Gee whiz, one and uh, seven eighths inches per second. So now, of course, I did play some music samples earlier recorded using this recorder. Um, so I'll play a little bit more stuff.
before I move on to showing footage I shot earlier of this recorder when I had it apart and was, you know, showing the capacitors, showing the transport mechanism, all that kind of stuff, you know. But before I show that footage, I want to show some more close-ups and stuff. Some, some shots you can just shoot better without a freaking tripod. So, that's what I'm going to do here. machine, I must say. show some of that footage of the uh, inside of the recorder. I have the Telectro opened up here prior to any capacitor replacement. Of course Clydeside has a video on the same, on the same model Telectro and he shows the mechanical operations. But um... I got the flywheel out sitting over there. Look at these old capacitors. Some of them have a little bit of admittance of AC. Although several of them of course are completely dead. This is an American made recorder. You look at the inside, there are certain telltale signs that this is clearly American made. But one interesting thing that is not American are the capacitors. These are old German capacitors, or West German at the time period. It's very interesting to see the use of German electrolytic capacitors in this American recorder. Especially considering that the other parts are American, like those transformers are screaming USA, USA. And then these transistors are RC, old RCA Germanium 2N408 on the output there. And this transistor is a 2N408. And this nice, beautiful, golden transistor is a 2N633. Which I also believe is going to be germanium. Interesting that transistor being used, kind of being so different than all the others. 
um, TO18 if I remember correctly package and you can also see the AC bias oscillator transformer right there one amazing thing to note is that this is only a four transistor tape recorder most four transistor tape recorders are DC bias because the, all four transistors are typically used in the amplifier this one of course it's only four transistors but is AC bias believe it or not I presume that the one of the transistors or maybe a pair of transistors is used for the oscillator while the other remaining are used for the amplifier when recording so I know some tape recorders do use that kind of design of switching amplifier transistors into oscillators for recording and using the remaining for the amplifier. I know the low, the low opti Opticord 412 is like that, for example. So I believe that's what's going on with this recorder as well. And um, anyway, the original belts are still good. The rubber in this is in surprisingly good shape. Uh, really, the main problem with it is cosmetic in nature because I mean, this has seen that chrome has seen better days. You can see kind of how it's kind of eaten away there from corrosion not battery corrosion but just I don't think it's battery corrosion I think it's just corrosion probably from humid air or moisture or something which is really a shame but still a very interesting recorder and otherwise in very good shape and the transport mechanism was working like a dream when I first powered it on. It's just the amplifier was extremely weak for any audio from tapes. And of course, seeing that one of the some of these capacitors are completely dead kinda is a dead giveaway, pun intended. Yeah, I was a bit lazy. I didn't bother even taking the circuit board off. Being axial, I just clipped the leads right out the ends of the capacitors and yo boom! stuck new axial lead condensers in and look at those beauties in there now old Nichicon and Sprague capacitors these two 10 microfarads happen to be tantalum I'm pretty sure or you could say new old stock and there are they are still good when tested on the ESR meter okay I want to show something here I'm going to put a capacitor a, a thousand microfarad capacitor across the motor. You hear all that sound in the amplifier? Hear how much of the sound gets less when I put a capacitor in there. Considerably less putting a capacitor across the motor. One problem this amp has is this. When the volume is beyond a certain point, it makes that sound. Oh dear, that's not good. I believe it's a grounding issue. Here's the audio freak. Here's the audio output jack right here. External speaker. No dropping resistor for the headphone level, I don't think. Uh, just uh, yeah, it's not. It's no dropping resistor for it. It's just external speaker out. I already hooked up a speaker to it. Matter of fact, if I hook up an external speaker to it, do you do, you do not have that uh, uh, oscillating problem? Now, not only that, you can see the okay. The transformer outputs kind of hard to see where they go, but the output transformer here, one of the connections on there goes to this wire right here and that goes to the ground connection or the ring connection on the jack that is the ground side and that goes to a printed circuit directly to the output transformer well actually not a printed circuit directly to it, it goes to a jumper on this side and a jumper then goes to the output transform. It also goes to a common ground connection on the circuit board. If I hook up the speaker, 
this side, which will connect it directly to the chassis. If I hook it up to the output of the transformer, which goes to ground, right here, oh, no problem. I put it onto the jack itself, no problem. I put it onto the metal around the jack, a little bit of a problem. I put it onto the metal that the chassis that's then connected to this metal piece. And oh dear. So it looks like the electrical connection between the actual jack itself and this metal piece here is not so good. And then the connection additionally suffers from this piece here to the chassis of the recorder. So I'm just going to need to back the screw out, back this out clean it a little bit, maybe put some WD-40 in there to kind of help with the contact and then put it back in and that will probably fix the problem. I took that jack off and the metal didn't look so uh, you know fresh like it looked like it was oxidized a little bit so I just took this screwdriver and kind of scraped away on the metal made it shiny there so I can get better electrical contact and that should be step one to resolving the problem so when I took this piece off I scraped a little bit on this metal piece there underneath where that screw goes and put it back put the speaker connection back onto the chassis ground here and now no more oscillation problem simple as that Dude.